So um, an equation. For this right-hand side of the equation to be linear, it has to be linear in y, not linear in x, OK? So if it's linear only in y but not x, it's called a linear system. But if, if it's actually not a function of x over here at all, then it's the fourth case, OK? So-called constant coefficients, which I'll talk about and explain all this in great detail. And that's the material you need to do the homework, OK? So it's like probably useful to get to, to the whole thing. We'll get through the whole thing, no problem. OK. So um, just like systems of linear algebraic equations are e most easily formulated in matrix vector form, so are sets of differential equations, OK? So if we have something like a differential equation system, then we're going to write this in a typical vectorized form, which I will explain to you today. OK. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about the second point, just one slide. But um, you know, in any kind of mathematical problem one solves, it's nice to know that a solution exists to the problem you're attempting to solve. It's kind of like when we solve sets of linear algebraic equations, um, you know, ax equals b. We looked at the properties of a and b for which this system was guaranteed to have a solution and the solution would be unique, OK? Um, so I'm going to do that very briefly here. But for the most part, we're going to assume that the solutions exist and we don't really have to worry about it. The assumptions you need for this to be true are mild, not very restrictive. So we won't worry about it too much, but I will talk about it. Um, if, you have a set, if, if you have a set of linear, excuse me, differential equations and they're linear in the sense I will explain to you and I kind of already alluded to, then you can solve these things analytically. And to do it, you need to be able to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, okay? So we're going to soon approach problems that look like this, okay? So y here is a vector, a is a matrix. And in order to solve this set of differential equations, I'm going to show you that that involves taking the A matrix and finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix, OK? And that's, that's, the main, that's actually the main point, which will come in the last third or something of the lecture. Um, if the system is not like this, in other words, the right-hand side of the equation is not a linear function of y, but is some nonlinear function of y, then typically you're not going to be able to solve this analytically, and you have to use MATLAB. So as usual, I'll teach you how to do the linear stuff um, analytically. And that would, be, of course, be the focus of homeworks and tests. And then um, I'll show you how to do the um, nonlinear differential equations in MATLAB. And that's the last MATLAB homework will be on that. And if you do the project on differential equations, it'll be that as well. All right, so just to get things rolling here. So let's say you have two differential equations that look like those two, OK? So if you have two differential equations, you have two um, dependent variables. In this case, I'm calling them y1 and y2. You have one independent variable, which we'll call x. On the right-hand side of each equation is some function. I'm not telling you what the function is now, but it could depend on either dependent variable, y1, y2, or both, and could depend on the independent variable x. Okay. And so if you have two equations like this, it becomes convenient, for example, to write this in vector form. And the first thing we're going to do is define a vector y. And that's just, whoops, I'm sorry. The vector y is going to be y1 and y2 stacked on top in a column vector. And then we'll define a um, vector function called f. That just consists of putting these two functions in a vector, f1 and f2, and calling that boldface f. And if you do that, you can rewrite these two systems of equations like that. It's just much more compact and much easier. It means the same thing. Okay. And obviously, if you can do this for two equations, you can do it for as many equations as you want. So this is just the case where we have n equations instead of two. And so in principle, on the right-hand side, you'll have a function. It can depend on x and any of the va variables y. For most problems, it won't depend on every value y. It'll depend on the subset of them. But for now, we'll say the right-hand side of each differential equation can depend on every value of y, y1, y2, y3 up to yn. And so we do the same thing here. Define a vector y, stack all the dependent variables on top of each other in a column vector like this. Do the same thing with the functions on the right-hand side. Put them in a vector function called boldface f and rewrite the equations like that. Okay? So it's just like, you know, so it's a differential equation analog of writing equations in matrix vector form for linear algebraic equations, let's say. Okay? All right. And Hopefully, when you, when you look at us, I'm guessing you haven't really seen this because you don't really cover this in differential equations, right? 
So in differential equations, I'm, assume, I'm assuming you learn how to solve a single differential, first order differential equation or a single second order differential equation, right? So you might solve equations that have second order derivatives, but there's never more than one equation, okay? So we'll, we'll change that today. Because in chemical engineering, most problems, not all, but most problems are sets, more than one, of first order differential equations. And the equations are coupled together, meaning if you look at this example, this equation here, the right hand side will depend on y2, and this equation down here will depend on y1. So you have to solve them together. You can't solve them separately or one at a time, okay? They're coupled. All right, so I know you guys haven't had reaction engineering, but still, <laughs> they're, they're my favorite example. So. I just, at this point, I'm just giving you the equation and just telling you where it comes from. So this would be a chemical reactor problem, and I'd have to see, have to think what the kinetics are here. Let's not worry about it now. This is an example, we'll come back up, but, so what this is is three differential equations, okay? So the differential equations are written for the three species of interest here, where they're called A, B, and C, so we're interested in the, how the concentration of those three species changes with time. So we end up writing out mass balances for these using the ideas of reaction kinetics, which you guys will learn later, so don't worry about it right now. But you can see, so we have two equa three equations, one for concentration of A, one for concentration of B, one for concentration of C. And you can see that each equation depends, I think, on A, B, and C. So if you look at the right-hand side, right, they each depend in some way, a nonlinear way, on A, B, and C. And those, those expressions have meaning. There's reasons like there's three and cubed and things like this. We'll, we'll get to that at some point. Um, and so first thing you should recognize here is that these three equations are, are kind of what I'd say fully coupled together. Like if you want to solve this equation for CA, you need to know CB and CC, right? If you want to solve this one, this depends on CA and CC. This depends on B and C, sorry, A and B. So they have to be solved simultaneously. Okay, you've got to solve all three equations at the same time. Second thing, hopefully you know, is if you want to solve a differential equation, you need a boundary condition. You guys are, I think you probably usually call these initial conditions, okay? So in other words, if I want to know, to solve this equation, which we're not focusing on this second, but means to generate a solution that tells you how the three concentrations change with time, right? Because time is the independent variable. That's what I mean by a solution. And to tell you where CA is going to go in the future in terms of time, I have to tell you where it's going to start. It's just reasonable. That's called the initial condition. And so to solve this, I'd have to give you the initial condition, for example, of these three species, initial concentrations. Okay. The third point is these equations are nonlinear. Okay. So for these equations to be linear, you see the three, independent, the three dependent variables are CA, CB, and CC. Okay. The only way for these equations to be linear, for example, if you took this equation for CA, it would ha you'd have to be able to write it like some constant times CA plus some constant times CB, some other constant times CC. That's linear, okay? Every variable, every dependent variable appears linearly. And it would have to appear that way in all three equations, okay? If that was true, the system is linear. Otherwise, system is nonlinear, and you can see it's nonlinear for several reasons. One is all over the place you have two concentrations multiplying each other. That makes it nonlinear. Here you have concentration squared, here cubed, okay? So it's, it's, not, it's not linear. All right, so if you want to put this in uh, this kind of vector form, you would do the following, okay? First of all, you would form a vector y. That's the three dependent variables stacked on top of each other in a column vector like that. You could do the same thing with the initial condition. Right? So you take the three initial conditions and you put those in a column vector and you call that y0 for initial condition. That's those three values right there in a column vector. And then if you want to write this in vector form, then all you have to do is write it like this and in each one of these rows corresponds to one of the equations, right? That's the right hand side for the first equation, right hand side for the second equation, third equation. Okay? It's not a major advance in human understanding here. <laughs> it's just convenient. All right? So we can all, so typically what we're going to do is just write um, the equations like this, okay? And then if, if, I, actually, if I wanted you to solve an equation, I'd have to tell you what F is, right? So, but generally I'm just going to say it's a differential equation. The right-hand side is F. Don't worry about it for now. 
how we want to solve it. Okay, now I put this in real quick because um, I want to make sure that you understand that. Let's say you have, you guys have done second order differential equations, I hope, right? And I assume you've done something that looks like this. Let's just say it's homogeneous, okay? Right? And the first thing you probably do is you, you form a polynomial here to find roots, right? And the blah, blah, blah. Those are the eigenvalues, by the way, as we'll learn, okay? Um, okay, so you know how to solve this kind of problem. And they don't do third order equations, I hope. Maybe they do. But, you know, these are the kind of problems in chemical engineering, these things come from like diffusion problems, okay? Mass diffusion or, or heat conduction type problems. You know, for, you may not have heard like Fick's law of diffusion or Fourier's law of heat transfer, things like this. So you'll see these coming up in heat and mass, for example. And so let's say you have a single uh, second order differential equation. I wrote it a little more generally, right? So all I've done is said, okay, we have a second order derivative on the right hand side. There's some function of might depend on the x, depends on the derivative of y, depends on y. In other words, what I've wrote is more general than this because it allows, you could, it could be a nonlinear function of the derivative and things like this. That's just an example I'm sure you've seen. All right, so here's my proposition that I can take any system that looks like this and make it into a first order system, okay? Because all the techniques I'm gonna tell you are for systems of first order differential equations. So if you get a problem like this, that's not first order, second order. So I'm gonna convert this into two first order differential equations because I like that, okay? So this is a definition here. I'm going to define y1 to be y, that y right there. I'm going to define a variable called y2, and it's going to be the derivative of y. You might say, why are you going to do that? And the answer is because it's convenient. Okay? And I'm going to put those two y's in a vector called y1 and y2. All right. So that means if you were to write out what the derivative of y1 is, let's say, So I, I want now differential equations for y1 and y2, okay? So I'm gonna write the derivative of y1, well that's the same as the derivative of y, right? Because y1 and y are the same thing. And by definition, I, ca I, call, that, I call that derivative y2, right? This is just an application of my definition, basically, not much else. And then, if you wanna take, find the other differential equation, the one for y2, then you take the derivative of y2. Well, you know y2 is the derivative of y, so that gives you the second derivative, right? And according to the equation I have up there, it's, that's f of x and y and what? D dy dx, okay. So y, or say I should say dy dx is defined to be, right? That thing right there is what we call dy dx. And that thing right there, oh sorry, these are supposed to be y's, my fault. Y and y. Okay, you get the idea? So I define this vector y1 and y2 to be y and the derivative of y, and then I seek to find differential equations for y1 and y2, so I can write it as a system of first order differential equations. The derivative of y1 is just equal to y2, obviously. The derivative of y2 is the second derivative of y, and the second derivative of y is that. And then that thing right there is what I called y2, and that thing is what I called y1. So that makes this function, I can rewrite this function in terms of y1 and y2, okay? So the bottom line is if anyone ever gives you a second order differential equation like this, you can always write it as two first order differential equations in the way I just showed you. Why do I show you this? Because I'm not ever going to talk about this again. <laughs> okay? it's, so if you ever heard, sometimes you'll read a math book and you'll see this thing here. That means without loss of generality. So in other words, I can talk about first order differential equations and I, I don't need to talk about second order differential equations because I can always make them first order differential equations. So I'm never going to talk about second order derivatives again. Okay, with the idea that I always convert it into first order differential equations if I need to. All right? All right. 
So let's say we want to make the problem a little more specific, a little simpler. So we're not going to consider the right-hand side of the equations to be general nonlinear functions. Now we're going to consider these things on the right-hand side to be nonlinear functions only of x. Okay? So if you can write your differential equations like this, okay? so you have two differential equations, let's say. You can write the right-hand side to be linear in y1 and y2, not necessarily x. Okay? x is the independent variable. It doesn't need to be linear in the independent variable, just the dependent variable. Okay? If you can do that, the differential equations are said to be linear. Okay? They have to be linear in, in y1 and y2. And if they're linear in this way, then you can rewrite it like this, right? We'll define a vector y1, y2, and then we'll put these a things in a matrix, and then we'll write it like this, dy dx equals a of x. Well, the a is a function of x, right? It's those components there. For example, if you multiplied the first row here, you'd get that times y1, that times y2, that would be that equation right there, okay? So it's just, uh, so you have to understand, if, if we're talking about linear differential equations in general, that, that means that you can write it in this kind of matrix form, just like we did linear algebraic equations, but the A matrix can depend on X. We're not going to focus much on when it depends on X because it's harder to solve, but being a linear equation doesn't require that the right-hand side be linear in X, only linear in Y. And obviously, if you can do this for two equations, you can do it for as many equations as you want. So if you had N of these equations, that means on the right-hand side, it'd be linear in all the Y's. It might depend on all the Y's in general. So the first equation, second, all the way down to the last equation. Now you define a, a vector Y that's all the Y stacked on top. There's not N of them. Sorry, there's not two of them. There's N of them. Now this is an N by N matrix where the coefficients are those things there. Just looks just like a matrix problem you've seen before. It's just the entries now depend on X. Okay? And now you get a set of equations that look like that. Okay? So if you can write equations like that, or you know, like that, but this may be easier to see, the, the system is linear. So that's a linear differential equation system. Okay, you can take it a step further and say, what if those coefficients don't depend on x? They're just constants. Okay, and this is, the, this is what you get in the homework. Okay. So if these coefficients don't depend on x, you can drop the dependence of these coefficients on x <laughs> and write the equation like that and rewrite the problem like this. It's equivalent to what I wrote on the previous page. Just none of these a's depend on x. They're just constants, you know, 2, minus 3, 4, whatever. Right? If they depend on x, the coefficients could be 2x squared, 3e e to the x, whatever. But now we're assuming they're just constant. And this is the, really the problem we want to focus on um, today, and this is the problem you're going to need to know how to solve for your homework. If you have n differential equations instead of 2, it's just more of the same n equations, stack y into a vector with n components, form a matrix that's all these coefficients. The coefficients of the first rows are the coefficients of the first equation, just like always. Okay? This just looks just like a matrix problem. We've already done this problem without the derivative, right? No derivative. This looks like ax equals 0. We've done that before. So it's all the same notation. Just now we have a derivative and the y is a vector here. All right. So this is what's known as a linear differential equation system with constant coefficients. And that's the, that's the one that we can easily solve, and that's the one I'm going to focus on, and that's the focus of the homework that you're going to do um, whenever you get around to doing it. But we agreed it's due Thursday, at least. All right, so we did, we did do this. We did, do, we did get to this example. So this is in the lecture notes on um, ordinary differential equation models. You know, that was the lecture I stopped halfway through because we ran out of time, but the idea there is ra basically write out mass, component, and energy balances. So this was two tanks in series. You remember this one? This is where there was a flow coming into the first tank, WI, okay? And that, then there was a flow coming out of the first tank, and that went into a second tank, okay? And for this simple problem here, we said the flow out of the first tank is going to be some linear function of the level in the first tank. This is some characteristic of a valve or something, the resistance to flow on the outlet. And we said the same thing for W2, different valve, but the flow out of the second tank will be a linear function of the level in the second tank. And then we wrote out mass balances. It's all in the notes, and we came up with these two equations. Okay? First equation was a mass balance on the first tank. 
um, second equation is mass balance on the second tank. So I've explained everything here. This is the density of the fluid. This is the cross-sectional area of the first tank and the second tank, right? So let's say you want to solve these two equations. To solve them, again, means that you want to know how H1 depends on time and how H2 depends on time, okay? All right. So to do this, you have to know the initial level, right? So if you want to know where the level's going in the future, you got to know where it starts. So those are the two initial conditions. So we can write this in the form I just told you instead of linear differential equations. What I would do here is I'd define y to be a vector of the two dependent variables, h1 and h2, like that. y0 would be a vector of the two initial conditions, that thing and that thing, in a vector. And then I would write this. I, I have a little additional term here, which I'll get back to. But generally speaking, I'll try to write this as dy dt equals ay. Okay? So what are the coefficients of a? They're the coefficients in this equation. So, for example, if you look at this equation, what multiplies h1? That's minus cv1 over rho a1. That's that coefficient there. What multiplies in this equation h2? There is no h2 in that equation. So that's why there's a 0 there. Okay? And then you can look at what multiplies h1 in the second equation. What multiplies h, whoops, typo, h2? That should be a 2 right there two in the second equation, and you can get these coefficients, okay? So in other words, if you took this, if you want to generate the second equation, you could say dy d, right, dy2 dt equals that thing times y1, which is h1, that thing times y2, which is h2, and you'll regenerate that equation. Just another way of writing the same thing, okay? All right, of course, the difference here is that there's also this term floating around. Right? There's, this term doesn't involve h, but it's not 0 either. And so we have to add that on to the first equation. Right? So the first equation is that times y1, also known as h1, plus that. Okay? So this equation actually looks like a times y plus some b. It's not homogeneous, in other words. Okay? And then it has some initial conditions. So this looks, it's not that easy to find a homogeneous problem. <laughs> so I, this one's not homogeneous. It's because the first reactor has flow coming into it. That's why it's not homogeneous. And for tank problems, you kind of need a flow coming in. Otherwise, the tank's not very interesting. It just empties. OK? All right. So the next trick I'm going to teach you, so there's, been, there's two tricks here. The first trick, remember, is that if you have an equation that's second order, you can always write as two first order differential equations. OK. The second trick I'm going to teach you is that if the problem is not homogeneous like this, and you understand what I mean by not homogeneous here is two things. First of all, you see that term that's not homogeneous? That's a constant. That's not a function, right? You see the wi? At this point, I'm assuming that's a constant. It's, it's a different goal story if it's a function, a function of time. Okay? Then you have a right-hand side that equals a function of time. Now it's just, I'm assuming, it's just a constant. Okay? So this thing is a constant, and this differential equation involves time, right? You understand, I do a lot of things with time because I like time, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, you know, the other, other independent variables could be space, right? Right, there's four dimensions. There's are three spatial dimensions and, and time. So I tend to write a lot of equations where the independent variable is time. And so if you have something that is a differential equation in time, that system might have a steady state. You know what I mean by steady state? That means what the solution looks like for really large values of time. It doesn't make sense for something to have spatial coordinates unless you're talking. You guys haven't taken heat or mass or any of that stuff, right? But when you do, you'll learn how to like heat transfer in the semi-infinite slab, like a slab that starts here and goes on forever. <laughs> okay. Um, so, but systems that are dynamic, meaning they depend on time, can have steady states. I mean, the steady state or equilibrium point is where the system wants to rest. If you don't perturb it, it'll stay there, OK? So I'm using the fact that this is a constant. And I'm also going to use the fact that these are differential equations in time. And I'm going to convert this equation into a homogeneous problem, OK? Why? Because homogeneous problems are easier to solve. Because you remember how to solve a non-homogeneous problem, right? You find the homogeneous solution and then a particular solution, and you add them together. Does this sound familiar? Right? I don't like finding particular solutions because they're particularly annoying. So I'm going to take my problem and convert it into a homogeneous problem. And the trick goes something like this. 
All right. So you have this set of differential, linear differential equations, but not homogeneous. If it was homogeneous, B would be 0. Okay? This looks just like the problem on the previous page. I gave you the A and the B and the Y explicitly for that problem. Okay? All right. So by steady state or equilibrium point, I mean that the derivative equals 0, right? If a system is at a steady state, the Y is not changing with time anymore. That's what you mean by steady state. And so I'm going to call the value of y, right, y is a vector. I'm going to call that value of the y vector y bar, right? Because this y here actually depends on time, but I don't write it because I'm lazy. So I need to differentiate the one that depends on time from one that does not. The one that does not gets a bar on top of it, okay? This is the steady state value of y. And again, if this is a two-component system, this is a vector that looks like You know, steady state value of y1, steady state value of 2 in a column vector. All right. So now I'm going to make the assumption that the, that matrix A there is invertible. Okay. So for it to be invertible, obviously it has to be square. It's obviously square, right? Because on the left hand side is the derivative of y, and on the, on the right hand, I mean, over here is the derivative of y. You can't see where I'm pointing. <laughs> That's the derivative of y, and that's y there. So a is definitely square, because it just maps y to its derivative. So it has to be square. But it may or may not be invertible, but we'll assume it is. And if it is invertible, you can solve for y bar like this, right? This basic concept of linear algebra. Move the b over to the left-hand side. Multiply on the left-hand side of each one by a inverse, and you'll get y bar to be that. OK? All right. So cool. So now I'm going to make a definition here. I'm going to define something called y prime to be the difference between y and y bar. Okay. So y prime is a variable, and it tells you how far away you are from steady state. If y bar is 0, you're at steady state. Otherwise, you're not. Okay. Why do I know to define that? Because it's convenient and because I've done it before. All right. So now I'm going to seek to get a differential equation in y prime. And my proposition here is a differential equation in y prime is homogeneous why the differential equation y is not. That's why I'm playing this game. Okay. So I'm going to generate a differential equation for y prime. So to do that, I have to take the derivative of y prime, right? The derivative of y prime is the derivative of that minus the derivative of that, right? That's a constant. Its derivative is 0. So the derivative of y prime and derivative of y are the same thing because they only differ by a constant. So that's where, I, that's where I get this here, okay? All right, and I know that dy dt equals this here, right? a times y plus b. So there's the a, there's the b. What happened to the y? I substitute it in for this equation, right? Because y equals, w if I rearrange this equation for y, it's y prime plus y bar, and that's that right there. So this is a variable, I don't know if you guys have done this, it's just a variable transformation. I'm taking an equation in a variable I don't like called y and putting it in a form I like in terms of a new variable called y prime. Okay. So now I have this equ equation written in terms of y prime here, right? Um, and it still doesn't look homogeneous right, at this point. But luckily it will be, because if we work this out here, right, so we have dy prime dt, that's right there. Take the first term there, that's a times y prime. Now you have a times y bar as this term. But y bar is that right there. So I plug that thing in there. And then I have to add on the b. Okay. And obviously, if I take um, a and multiply times a inverse, I get i. If I multiply i times b, I just get b back. So it's minus b plus b. The b cancels. That's the whole game here. So now I get a times y prime. Right, so what was a non-homogeneous equation in y is a homogeneous equation in y prime. So now I can solve it in terms of y, in y prime, and then I can always get the solution back for y from this equation here, right? Because if I know y prime, I know that, that uh, all I have to do is add y bar and to get the y back. This is a common trick in math, right? I don't want to solve this problem. Let's say I don't know how to solve that problem. Then I reduce it to a problem I know how to solve, which is this one, solve it, and then transform it back to y when I'm done. All right? OK, so now I'm not going to talk about non-homogeneous problems. <laughs> At least not, that, not where the non-homogeneity is a constant. 
this would be a different ball game if this was a function of time, right? Because then this whole argument would fall apart. It would fall apart where would it fall apart? Um, Let's see. I know it falls apart somewhere, people. <laughs> Let's see. Well, let's see. This is fine. That's fine. Mm hmm. Hmm. I don't see where it falls apart. I'm sure there, I know there's a problem with it, but I can't, f I can't see what it is now. But for now, let's just say, if you have a differential equation that looks like this, it, and it, it um, just has an additive constant as a non-homogeneous term, you can convert it into a homogeneous problem like this. Okay? All right. So, before we get to how we actually solve these problems, this is just meant to give a one-page summary of when this problem has a solution, right? So in mathematics, we want to know when a problem has a solution and when the solution is unique. So this is the problem I'm analyzing here, right? System of differential equations, potentially nonlinear, right? Because I've written this some nonlinear function here. Some initial conditions. So this is called initial value problem. I want to know when this will have a solution, right? Because if, if We'd, we'd all be in trouble if this equation usually didn't have a solution because our lives depend on this equation having a solution. Because, <laughs> well, mass balances depend on this having a solution, and if mass w could, you couldn't do that, you'd all be concerned, okay? Because mass would no longer be conserved or something along these lines. So, so we want to know when does this equation have a solution? So this is just a general thing. We're not going to prove it, and all I'm going to try to convince you of is that you can safely assume equations always have a solution, okay? All right. So I introduced this problem before, uh, maybe about a week ago, something called the Jacobian matrix. Remember, I, I introduced this in the context of solving linear algebraic equations. So solving a linear algebraic equation would just mean this derivative equals zero, right? But if you consider the Jacobian matrix for this problem, it means you take this function, right? This is an n-dimensional vector function. And it's, uh, may, maybe it's easier just to write it for the two-dimensional case. The dots and the indexing doesn't bother me, but my experience is when people see this kind of thing with dot, 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 and they have, you know, lots of indexes, they don't like it so much. But if this was a two-dimensional problem, two differential equations, then you would just have these derivatives here. So that's the function on the right-hand side of the first equation. It's derivative with respect to both of the, yeah. Sorry. Dependent variables y1 and y2. Hope I didn't screw that up on the slide. Good. And then same thing for the second equation. That's the right-hand side of the second equation. Okay. So this matrix of partial derivatives is called the Jacobian matrix. Okay? And it plays a key role into whether this thing will have a solution. So, so there, there's the problem we want to solve. Here's just a definition. Here's the result. Okay? So again, when you see these kind of things in a book, the goal is not to like figure out how they were proved. I guess if you wanted to, you could try to prove it or whatever. 